Get used to this face, pretty boy. In the 90s, black comedy on TV is enjoying a moment. There was one point in the 90s where there's the largest concentration of black sitcoms we've ever seen. And Brent, beautiful guy, dynamite. Fox opened the door to black performers, black talent, black producers. But what's really driving this transformation? More money, more money. What matters more than black and white? Green. Green. It's good for your bottom line. Until boosting the bottom line leaves one star at rock bottom. Everybody knew that Martin was kind of falling apart. And an era ends just as it's getting started. They used black culture to their benefit until they were profitable and then deserted it. Tone low, 
Back in the 80s and 90s, I was saying, wow, dang it, fuck it, Cole Medina. We're going to be free from the nagging, persistent pain of taxes. You know, Red Fox might not have used that particular saying. You don't have enough souls. And the same in good times, uh, when they would argue, I mean, Thelma and JJ, you could honestly see that certain words were written definitely by a white person. You know? <laughs> Actor John Amos is fired from Good Times after frequently fighting with the writing staff over the show's caricatured portrayal of its black characters. And Amos is not the only one upset. As Lear begins work in the Jeffersons, he gets a visit from an organization looking to dismantle white power. At his production offices. And tells him that they want to see a black family who is not in the ghetto. So, George and Weezy moved to a deluxe apartment in disguise. This is the first time we're seeing an affluent black family on television. And the show was really talking about something. Because, again, we're, we're at a point in time where this is something that black people are, are going through in general, embracing this access to this higher level of class. Louise, you own an apartment in the building. She's a maid. Now, hold Right there, Buster. Ain't you forgetting where you came from? It ain't the question of where I came from. It's the question of where I am. But by the time we get to like 84, the show had lost its bite because America had changed. The civil rights gains of the 60s and 70s are helped along by massive economic growth in the 1980s. Now, the black middle class has grown. There's like an entire class of black professionals and black entrepreneurs and black kids in private schools and one sitcom turns that shift in demographics into the biggest hit of the decade of course a groundbreaking show the cosby show a show about a middle class family that happened to be black while the show is a departure from many of the stereotypical black sitcoms of the 1970s the very color blindness of the cosby show raises its own concern folks had the issues with the fact that it ignored issues of the black poor and talk about the social justice issues of the time like there was no real drama on the Cosby show ever a dozen chocolate devil's food donuts for breakfast there's bran in those donuts i would say there was a turning point when the Cosby show spins off into a different world i know That's when we kind of see a shift now to, all right, let's focus on the younger generation. And that younger generation is increasingly obsessed with hip hop. What began as a uniquely American underground music genre has expanded out of the black community and into the mainstream. Top rap artists like Tone Loke and Kid and Play topped the charts. Ooh, in the 90s, we wore colorful clothing and had very distinctive hairstyles. Kid from the group Kid and Play. I'm your auntie's favorite rapper. All right. <laughs> Was that a good enough intro? <laughs> More than just a new kind of music, the golden age of hip hop spreads to all corners of popular culture. Who are you? When I started seeing Fred Flintstone rapping, trying to sell me some Fruity Pebbles, I'm like, okay, we made it. And in September of 1990, the first sitcom built around a hip-hop star hits the air. In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground of where I spent most of my days. Will Smith at the time was already known as, like, you know, the Fresh Prince. The very first to win a Grammy for the hip-hop category. This is a milestone in our career, and it's a milestone in the, the history of rap. While hip-hop has many powerful black producers, when it jumps over to TV, the network execs put white producers in charge, at least at first. So the control of production came to a lot of the white producers at NBC. So the first season is kind of more of a um, uh, traditional sitcom. 
second season came about and Will Smith's popularity just skyrocketed, he himself got an executive producer credit. Well, Carlton is not like you and me. You know what I'm saying? With those credits, they were able to hire more black writers, more producers, and that is when the show took off because it actually reflected a more intimate black perspective as well. I'm not accepting no prep school Bell at Bread sellout into my fraternity. I mean, you can stop all no, that. Wait, Will. There's, you know, episodes with absent fathers. How come you don't want me, man? At one point, Carlton ends up somehow in a game. Yeah. Yo, how you playing me, Prince? <laughs> what? Yo, you dissing me? Go, man, stop it. There's an episode where they're racially profiled. I'm Henry Firth. Good news, Mr. Firth. Your car is safe and sound, and we've got the perpetrators. Those aren't the perpetrators. Those are my partner's son and nephew. Partner? Legal partner. You grow up rich, and you still have that skin tone, that melanin in you. It doesn't matter. Well, uh, and when I think that's what Will wanted to represent, and it was telling Carl. We were detained for a few hours. Dad cleared things up, and we were released. The system works. I hope you like that system because you're going to be seeing a whole lot of it during your lifetime. Not it does run the gamut of real life experience and even a black experience, even if it's an alternative black experience. And I think you needed a uh, black person. People identified with it. And I, I think it's one of those shows to show that human stories are human stories. It didn't matter if you were black or white. And so it brought in this great crossover audience. But man, it was just a great show, man. It was woo, a great show. Like, you know, like I said, we didn't have a whole bunch of shows. So the ones we had, we, you know, we, you know, we clung to them. You know what I mean? The funniest night on television just got funnier. Yes, and I'm tickled pink. The success of NBC's Fresh Prince doesn't go unnoticed by competitors. The recently launched and struggling Fox network sees there's money to be made with black programming. What matters more than black and white? Green. Green. It's good for your bottom line. From inspiration born of desperation, Fox ushers in a new era of groundbreaking black television. Am I black or white? You're under arrest. That some people see as a cynical bid to build its brand. So I guess I am black. And they do it on the backs of black artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These home installed dishes bypass local TV stations. And By 1990, cable and satellite are starting to lure affluent, mostly white households away from traditional over the air broadcast television. From the channels on cable TV. Leaving a much more diverse audience still exclusively watching network TV. And Fox, okay, this is a market that's underserved, so let's give them something. The goal wasn't because they enjoy black culture so much. The goal was profit. How can we be different? How can we get our eyes away from those networks onto our networks? So we can one go to find nice women here. They start by luring away talent from your big screen rivals. We have been to every bar in Queens. There was a little bit of a, what I would call a black rat pack happening. There was Robert Townsend, Eddie Murphy, Arsenio Hall, you know, Damon and Keenan. Really funny black guys who were producing and doing their own thing. Keenan Ivory Waynes had just came up with a film, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker. The only thing you'll be able to handle Soldier Boy is a wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, ain't nobody laying a finger on my baby. Ma! And Fox said, let's bring these individuals to television. That's just money in the bank for us. How'd you do that? Fox had the money, so they said, here, take this money, do whatever you want with it, and make us different. So, you know, they, they gave Keenan, you know, free reign. With this creative freedom, Wayans creates a sketch comedy show that will end up laying the... And what a lot of people don't know is that we shot the pilot and it took almost a year, I think, for Fox to pick it up. I'm Kim Coles and in the 90s I spent time on two shows that had the word living in the title, In Living Color and Living Single 2. Ding! And I do my own sound effects. 
you know, while we were all waiting, someone said, oh, I saw your show in Living Color. And I was like, how did you see the show? It's not a show yet. We only shot the pilot. Someone had taken the show and bootlegged it. And they were selling VHS tapes on the street in Harlem, in, in Brooklyn, in Queens. And so I knew immediately that this show was going to work because people were so excited that they were seeing people of color doing these crazy, wonderful, funny, funny, funny oh, things. Let's say hello to Mike Dyson. Hi, Mike. Hi, Marvin. Now, that show was a funny-ass show. He's just a boxer from Brooklyn, and of course, I was a Harvard medical student. It was a meshing of talent that was groundbreaking. I'm Monica Swan. And I was a part of the casting of some of the best comedy there was in the 1990s. Even if you watch it now, you know, everything is still funny. It still works. with its mostly black cast, soon draws a passionate fan base that its rival, the mostly white sketch SNL, can only dream about. The Living Color had a way of really bringing people to it, like a cult. I think you got it back with, son. <laughs> that main set of characters, you know, Homie of the Clown. That's why Homie don't play that. Fire Marshal Bill. They made fun of black people. Who are you? about class. He's right. I've been sitting here for 15 years with this damn thing in my ear. I ain't got one raise yet. We talked about everything. Is that all good for? To be your little secretary? Or your occasional chocolate fantasy? The show deliberately pushes boundaries. This one's called Moby Dick. I get goose pimply just thinking about that big Mr. Moby. They did push it far. They were ridiculous with it. Which did what, what comedy should do. There were no sacred cows. And they really embraced this young urban culture to the max. The first couple years, that's when you see in Living Color really take form as a cultural phenomenon. Super Bowl 24 dedicates its halftime spectacular. And it became such a phenomenon that it changed how we watch America's biggest game. 40 years of happiness. Prior to In Living Color, the Super Bowl halftime shows had this kind of edge. It's the first ever all-kids Super Bowl halftime show! So in 1992, while CBS is airing a quaint Disney-produced halftime show... I know what you guys are thinking. You were thinking, hey, are these bozos going to make us miss any part of the second half? Fox counters with their own halftime special, a 27-minute live episode of In Living Color. It'll be coming on later in the show to let you know when... Switch back to the second half. You won't miss any of the senseless brutality. The stunt pulls almost 29 million viewers over to Fox while tanking CBS's second half ratings. People turned it off when it went when it went to halftime and went to watch In Living Color. Looking forward to a great second half of football. <laughs> Princesses are replaced by the King of Pop. As for Fox, instead of letting In Living Color press the attack, the network goes into a prevent defense. Fox at one point was like, okay, we are being taken seriously now. We should start to pull back on certain sketches and stuff. By the summer of 92, Keenan is in constant battles with the network censors over what he can and can't say on air. I made my Michael Jackson potato. Keen every way and said, you know, um, this control is kind of stifling the creativity. Something's just not quite right. I know. Fox also dilutes the show's appeal by syndicating it to local stations, a decision made without consulting weigh-ins. Thereby weakening his ability to make money and to make the show an even bigger success. How do you put a show in syndication while it's still on the air? Like, just, like, ah! 
protest on the season four premiere, Keenan Ivory Wayans makes his last on-screen appearance. We got some new cast members for you to meet. <laughs> Fox keeps it on the air, but within a year, the entire Wayans family has left the show. First up, we got Anne Marie Johnson. I left. Fox cancels in living color in 1994 after its fifth season. But the show's early success drives Fox's programming decisions for much of the 90s. All you needed was the one comedy that becomes a major hit. And, you know, this is a copycat business. This could hurt. At the height of In Living Color's success, Fox goes looking for more of the same. Baby, come on, Al. Sure. Yes, Martin, I'm sure. And in Martin Lawrence. This is what I'm going down. They find their next comedy juggernaut to exploit. Yeah. Do you know what this is all about? Do you know why we're here? To be out. In the early 90s, sitcoms featuring stand-up comedians are taking off. To celebrate our success. My next guest can be seen in Spike Lee's newest film, Do the Right Thing. And one of the hottest stand-up acts of the day is Martin Lawrence. Some black woman went off on me. You are out. is a cousin of one of the Chris's from Kid Play. He's Play's cousin. And came up in the industry with Kid and Play and Salt and Pepper. They all work at the same call center together in Queens. It was an amazing array of talent that jumped up out of that. The critical and commercial success of Kid and Play's movie House Party provides a step up for many screen careers, including Martin's. <laughs> We had a blast at the time, and these are friendships and talents that, you know, that are around to this day. I mean, who's bigger than Queen Lexi? The cut back one. Who's bigger than Martin Lawrence? Yo, chill. You know, Tisha is my girl. You pretty chill your damn self. Everybody went on to bigger and better, but we all worked together. It was all family. Mr. Martin! Martin! In 1991, Martin Lawrence signs the deal to make his self-named sitcom. Martin was that hot. You know, if Fox didn't get him, somebody else was going to get him. I'm quite sure there was a bidding war at that time, and he made the most of it. But if you keep running off at the mouth, I'm going to have to body slam you. Now get to going. Roll with it. You know, Martin is a, you know, it's a classic show to this day. Maybe not necessarily like a high brow comedy, but a very relatable comedy to a young audience. Romance doesn't make sense to me, though. Think about it. It was started by this little white boy, Cupid, who came... The Martin to Show, the you know, the black man, has his radio show in Detroit. I, mean, I don't know, talk to me, Detroit. What up? One of them himself was strong performers who could hold their own with someone who is used to standing on a stage by himself. in that bunch and then therefore it made the whole show even stronger this hotel is bossa nova and he had this ability to create these other characters it's bob from marketing hey what's happening what's happening what's happening all right he plays nine characters on the show himself and these characters were great now let me tell you how to take care of my mom plays you know his, his own mother on the show Child. Man, this is 
dope. You about to you about to win with this. And he was like, man, you need to jump on the show with me. And I'm like, of course. You hot, I'm hot, let's go. And we just start talking about it. I don't know what if a kid goes on a date with Shanae. Dating my homeboy. You know, I got him I'm hugging him up every day. You know what I mean? Like, Forever today, day. It's like a dream. But it was one of the most memorable episodes of Martin. So it was great for him, it was great for me, and it was great for us. <laughs> because if, if one of us wins, then that might be an opportunity for somebody else down those opportunities came quickly. Encouraged by the success of Martin, Fox hires black sitcom creators like no other TV network. We see these shows, you know, rock, South Central. Made it hip and fun to be black, which it is. <laughs> it's already hip and fun to be black. And to let people in, you know, open the doors on the culture a little bit. And all these black artists that come through the Fox network are all coming off of huge films and huge spaces of like black popular culture. You know, the, the hottest artists of the day are showing up, especially on Martin. was the place to watch that show. Martin's popularity and authentic, no-holds-barred comedy lands him the hosting gig on SNL. It also lands him in trouble with the NBC censors. But I'm meeting a lot of women out there, and you, know, you, you got some beautiful women, but you got some out there that uh, I got to say something. Um, <laughs> Some of you are not washing your ass properly. At this point in his monologue, Martin begins a commentary. The monologue is censored on repeat airings, and he's banned from ever returning to the show. Although we at Saturday Night Live take no stand on this issue one way or the other. But his fans love it. The next year, he launches what will become a half-billion-dollar film franchise with Will Smith. Back up off me. Man, you don't sit your lanky ass down. Bottom line, I will knock you the f*** out. Wrong with Chad Boys, of course, it was Martin Lawrence and Will Smith because in nine, early 90s, they were the two black men who were on top of the world. But Martin's fast rising career is about to come crashing down. Well, the event about you, day at the races. In 1994, NBC is number one in the ratings on a rebuilt Thursday night must see TV. It was the lineup that followed the Cosby show. A different world leaving here. You, you can't go by the audience that night. It was late. They were terrible. It's very white. I'm not. Uh, I'm thinking so, but <sighs> basically, you we went from a black Thursday night because Cosby and Different World was Thursday night to a very white Thursday night. Thursday, Ken Martin's new sneakers. Fox counters by creating a black Thursday night lineup anchored by two of its most popular sitcoms, Martin and Living Single. Only one thing stands between Kyle and a promotion. It's it was wildly successful, and while NBC's Thursday night is number one overall in all households, Fox's Thursday night is number one in, in black and brown households. But television.
television reporters didn't seem to live in black or brown households. But that Thursday night anchor was also like critics didn't get it. People were like, oh, we want to see a bunch of young black women sitting around talking about men and, and sex. With Martin, it's too much, it's slapstick, it's buffoonery. <laughs> black actors didn't get it made a great deal of progress the most established being the then sitcom legend bill cosby don't get me started on that dude yeah i heard those quotes back in the days bruh there's all different kinds of, of black people there's all different kinds of people of color do you do it your way it was very popular love the sweaters but look how you turned out So Bill Cosby shaking his finger at, at those TV shows and those comics at that time that idolized him. They loved him. Psh, got some nerve. Meanwhile, the person doing the most harm to Martin Lawrence is Martin Lawrence. The place I show funny everyone you see up here. Um, you know, uh, we work hard. It was kind of suffering from the results of, of, of a meteoric success. There's a little bit of substance abuse there. What has been known through tabloids, through papers, was already that Martin was dealing with a lot of uh, issues that came to be known as either bi bipolar disorder or manic depressive. By all reports, there was a lot of tension on set. He was at odds with most of the cast. Violent acts, uh, allegations of harassment, where cast members as well as crew members were threatened verbally, physically as well, too. Lawrence wanders into L.A. traffic, packing a loaded gun and ranting incoherently. After fighting with police, he is restrained and hospitalized. More reports of public violence follow. Not at all excusing any of his um, wrongdoings, but it is heartbreaking to see that these mental health issues that are that happening came out to violence and contributed to kind of a downfall of the show. The ratings of his show declined, along with his mental health. But Martin's Thursday night sibling is soaring. Living single is a classic, particularly in the community. You're right, because as opposed to a show uh, like Martin, which was, you know, obviously male lead, the ladies ran this. You slept with Kyle. You hate Kyle. I can't even believe you let him touch you. We used a condom. We had never had a show that was just about a bunch of single black women. It hadn't happened. One thing, you know, and young single black women kicking it. I picked Mary Tyler Poppins, and that's where we go. They are all just so pretty. I don't know which one to hit. <laughs> I was very aware that we were the first of our kind. You might want to back it up, honey. And here is a black show run by a black woman. And Yvette Lee Bowser did a great job of bringing this black feminist energy to television when nothing was like it at the time. Well, what about that fool else, baby? I did not come in and get whacked by these bitches. Who you calling a bitch? All right, watch yourself. You said it all. No, no. It's just a, an expression. No, man, it's a jacked up attitude. How dare you come in my house and disrespect my friends? Man, get out of my house. The minute the six of us had our first table read... I felt that energy of, wow, this is going to work. All right, look, let's get to the point. Y'all are not a couple, are you? Very quickly, we all became a family. <laughs> Scarecrow. My pet. Okay, I win, I win. Give me my money. Give me my money. Give me my money. The show's successful focus on a family of friends does not escape the notice of network rival NBC. Here's the thing. It has been said that when Warren Littlefield, who was the president of NBC at the time, was asked, are there any shows that you wish you had bought this season? He said, I wish I had bought Living Single. Living Single premiered in 1993, right? And that was the show anchored by Queen Latifah as the star character about four black women living in New York and the two black men friends who live across the hall from them. And then a year later comes Friends. 
white living single. And if you go back and look at, at the themes side by side, you will see quite a few similarities. Quite a few. Except in the paychecks. Just saying. The All White Friends instantly becomes a top ten show. While Living Single, airing in the same time slot, is never able to find its crossover audience. You've got your scooter, she's got her Daryl, and you've got your... And it was, it was hard. It was hard to see this show receive money and support and marketing dollars. It, it's, you know, it's still a sticky point. The same year Friends premieres on NBC, Fox offers up a huge amount of money to secure new, diverse programming. Today, the curtain opens on a new era. But what attracts Fox is the promise of its large, white, male audience. The NFL on Fox. And in 1994, they win the much-coveted broadcast rights to NFL Sunday football. And with that right, they're able to bring much more people to their to the network. And now they no longer feel like a little little brother, little sister network now. They feel like they're competing. And they didn't need to narrow cast a niche market anyway. They had built the network to where they wanted it to be. And there was a new network president that came in and decided that he wanted to change the tone. And I mean, by tone, I mean by skin tone of the network. And that's when you saw, you know, all these shows start to kind of fizzle away. When the NFL comes to Fox, the network cancels four of its six black primetime comedies. Martin and Living Single are moving to Thursdays. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you naked. Gentle. Only Living Single and Martin survive the calling. Martin Lawrence's battles with his personal demons on and offset transform his once loved sitcom into something fans don't recognize. The last season of Martin is uh, the season that nobody wants to talk about. There was ongoing allegations of sexual assault on set or sexual harassment. Campbell walks off the show mid-season. Then she sues Lawrence for sexual abuses endured throughout the run of the show. The suit is quickly settled out of court. Campbell even agrees to return for the series finale with one seemingly impossible condition. That she does not appear in any scenes opposite her longtime co-star. Setting the stage for a different kind. Of must see TV. What is that, you? As the series finale of Martin goes into production, tensions between the cast are worse than ever. <laughs> Tisha Campbell came back and said, I don't want to do any more scenes with him. But the crux of the show is their relationship. Hey, Tina, you know, what's up, baby? Hey, hey, baby, how you I'll meet you in the car, okay? We're going to miss our flight. Without the two actors ever appearing in such a mainstay for it to end so poorly and and kind of fizzle out it was really sad but the same thing happened with living single fox decided kind of abruptly to cancel it and it just wasn't wrapped up well at all the only thing that has not changed is the love i have for all y'all cheers, cheers. cheers. and i remember that we were replaced with a show that was wrong, 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 because you weren't catering to the audience that had built you up. Thursday night on Fox becomes home to shows where things crash and burn. And that is kind of like a analogy for the trajectory of black sitcom altogether. What a cute little girl, Carmine. By the summer of 98, Fox has dropped all black-led sitcoms from its schedule. T-G-I-F. Ow. Wow. It's a Fox inadvertently redefined black popular culture and then deserted it. But rival film studios like Warner Brothers, who are just getting into the TV network game, see an opportunity to crib from Fox's playbook. Fox's upstart strategy to target a black demo and grow their viewer base was so successful that when the WB started, when VPN started... Welcome to the first night of the... Network for the next century. They adopted a similar path. Look at you. Yes. Initially, this leads to an even bigger explosion in black lead sitcoms. And there was one point in the 97 actually where there's the largest concentration of black sitcoms we've ever seen. And the UPM picks it up to the point where there was a joke amongst black people for a very long time that it stood for You People's Network. Um, because there was just so much black television on 
on the UVN. So you see shows like Moesha, the Jamie Foxx show. Sister, sister. Now the Minetti. They had Homeboys in Outer Space. They had um, the Wayans Brothers. But the revival is short-lived. And once again, typically, both those networks did it as well. When they feel like the shows have outlived their uh, usefulness, then they'll cut them. By the end of 1997, just two years after its launch, the WB Network changes its focus to white teen TV. UPN continues courting black audiences a little while longer, but the balance of power has shifted. What changed largely was many of the shows weren't produced by black people. They, weren't, they didn't have black images on screen, but they didn't ever have the same effect as the shows at Fox and its prime. By the end of the 90s, the golden age of black sitcoms is truly over. By the time we get to like 2010, most of the black programming you see on television is reality TV. And so we had a dearth of black storytelling for about a decade. Only reinforcing the importance of the black lit shows that did make it to air in the 90s. We have the talent, the production team, story writers, every, everyone. That is why these shows were so important to this moment because they were giving black artists the authenticity and giving them the leeway to really construct their shows how they wanted to see blackness on the screen. And the work was good. You talking about Martin, you talking about living single. People bust their ass to get home on time to see the living color. Please, you know what I mean? That's good stuff. Every Sunday at 8, 7 Central. Fox was really the place where so much great African-American talent got a chance to work and be seen because not very many other places were talking to us. You know, this decade was the bridge decade. And of course, now the box is open and we're all, you know, going full force into to, to diversity. Time has also helped heal one of the decade's biggest stars. Yeah, we gotta go, though. I appreciate that. Martin Lawrence has now made amends with his former castmates, and he's gotten his career back on track. Meanwhile, the rise of streaming platforms hungry for content has driven an industry-wide resurgence in shows controlled by black creatives. Right down to the reimagining of a 90s classic. Welcome to Bel Air. What the hell is my life? And as of now, streaming seems like to be the best and most free place to produce black content from a black perspective. However, at some point, it's going to be too much for streaming as well, too. So we might just see the same thing repeat itself. I think we're in a better place. But you could always do more. I mean, it'd be great if, if one day it wasn't even, we didn't even have to talk about it. You know, it'd just be like, you know what I mean? This is a new show. Hope you like it.